Well, welcome everyone to uh, our Sonic Speaker Series, where today we have guest speaker Polo Chow, who's uh, the Associate Director of the Polo Club, and he also is uh, as, he's an Assistant Professor of Computational Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech, so you guys should hang out. And uh, <laughs> we'll do that afterwards, yes. Yeah. And uh, nor normally Nosh does these introductions, because uh, he has more of a personal connection, but uh, Polo and I connected this morning over MOBAs, like StarCraft 2, and Defense Aviations, <laughs> so <laughs> without further ado, Polo Chow. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about research that's happening at my group, um, specifically on the work that is combining data mining and human computing interaction, HCI, uh, about how to create scalable tools that uh, helpful for people to make sense of large graph data or network data. So a lot of the work that I am presenting today is from my group. So as Eric mentioned, it's the Polo Club of Data Science, the last time to ever m name anything after myself, so I need to do it a big way. So uh, the top, top row is uh, PhD students and a master's student on the left and an undergraduate student on the right. So a lot of the work that you see today, uh, basically them, I'm here just uh, the salesperson and uh, doing publicity for them. So uh, we work with uh, large graph and a lot of people call large network data, uh, a lot of you know, but just to get the terminology correct. Um, and um, there are many examples of large graphs, as you may uh, imagine. So there's the internet, which is a 50 billion ad, uh, node graph. Uh, the nodes are web pages, edges are the links, and Facebook, every time I need to present this, I need to update this. This is a 1.2 billion um, uh, no graph, so the no side users and the address of friendship. So many other areas in citation, you can have a citation networks, so, uh, academia citation networks, the, the no side papers and edges of citation edges. And as you can imagine, there are actually many, many more examples like this, right? So in, on Twitter, you can have a who follows whom. On Amazon, you don't really think of it as a network, but you think about who buys what, then that's a bipartite graph. All right, uh, cell phone network and uh, uh, biology and protein protein interaction network. So. Uh, many, many more examples like that. So these graphs are not only getting uh, larger, but also provide a new opportunity uh, for us to do exciting things. So here's some of the kind of big data, big graphs that uh, we analyze uh, in our group. So um, the largest one, the second one, is a graph from Symantec, and, uh, the software company, uh, security company that developed the Norton antivirus uh, software. Um, so this is a graph that's this graph of a 37 billion uh, uh, relationship between files and machines. So a file is connected to the machine if the files were ported by the machine. So I think Microsoft Word.exe appear on one million uh, machine that's connected to those one million uh, uh, machines. So examples uh, that we may be familiar like the web graph, uh, like the uh, Twitter, cell phone network, and so on. So whenever I put up this line, I need to make a disclaimer. So we not only work with large data, so we also work with small data, because small data also needs love. Uh, actually, more importantly in practice is that um, if you want to develop methods that work with large data, you may want to start with small data or subset of data anyway. Right? So if your technique does not work with small data, it's not going to work with large data. So yeah, this is an important disclaimer. Uh, so with all this uh, exciting data that we get, then uh, well, we can do a lot of exciting things. We can de develop new drugs, if you know how protein can interact. Uh, you can develop like uh, analysis of uh, market trend and so on. Right? So, but then also come up with, uh, come with a lot of challenges. And often challenges that I would really summarize as just like one single number uh, that, that's an inherent limitation of human beings that uh, make it really hard for us to really fully harness all this uh, um, potential uh, um, capability that, that we might be able to, to get from this data. Um, since I know this audience very pretty familiar with the literature, so I'm, I'm going to just review the answer. So usually I, I, I would let you guess a little bit, but uh, you already know it. So it's, it's often due to this and uh, uh, what we call the famous Miller's Law, which is that uh, in 19, our 1950s, they did a study look at how many items that uh, people can really keep their memory at a time. So meaning that even though people may potentially have access, can have access to all these uh, large amount of data, because of the limited uh, number of things that can really process at a time, or the attention they can really put on, um, it's only a very small number of things. So what it really means that even though you have a large amount of data uh, that you could potentially access, you can potentially use, but then in the end, what you really want to do is to really squeeze all this down 
to things that really people can care about or they can analyze, right? Um, so then we'll bring up so this the famous uh, slide that you probably have seen millions of times, turning data into insights, right? So a lot of people can say it, actually I'm saying it here, but the question is how do you actually do it? Right? You have a, lot, a large, large amount of data, you want to like, squeeze out, like, filter everything down to something that people really care about. So our approach is to combine techniques from data mining and human computer induction, or HCI for short. Um, so there's a good reason we're doing this because actually both fields have long been developing techniques to help people, they try to help people make sense of a large amount of data, but they do it very differently. So on the data mining side, they're focusing more on the automated techniques like summarization, um, classification, clustering, and so on. And by design, their techniques are, are very scalable, work with millions, billions of items. Um, on the other hand, from the XGI side, uh, we care a lot more about the user uh, interaction, uh, the visualization of the data, um, or how do you help with people's tasks and goals, right? So, uh, because all these, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, techniques are more manual in nature, so they are less scalable. Um, but you will see that they're actually very complementary on both sides. So uh, you could potentially have the interactive techniques which may complement the automated uh, techniques. Right? So to give you a sense of what I really mean by that as a well, how do we actually combine data mining and machine learning, I'm going to give you a very simplified example of how that might work. So imagine you're working at a telecommunication company and your boss is say, hey, so we have collected a lot of data about our customer who are making cell phone, uh, cell phone calls. So two customers connected by an edge if they made a phone call. Right, so, okay, so we have all this. And now go figure out a new ways to make more money for your company. So actually that's more realistic than you think. So these days, a tech company, they often have a lot of data. So much data that they don't really know how to best use of it. Um, if you take the traditional, say, information visualization approach, often what you may want to do is say, hey, so I have this new data, I don't really know how it looks like. Well, naturally, you might want to visualize it. So if you try to ever visualize a graph that uh, even like maybe a couple of thousand looks at, uh, looks at an address, you will get something that looks like this. So now we have at least three names for it. First is a beautiful hairball, the other is spaghetti, and then the third is Death Star. So you can use any of the other. <laughs> so, but the, the main point is that you will have a very pretty image um, that other than your looking, the first reaction is, oh, yes. And the second reaction, mm, what I do, really, really do with it. <laughs> so you will get some of these uh, kind of bright spots. And that's pretty much it. You probably don't really know how to go, go after that. Um, if, on the other hand, if you have uh, applied techniques from the data mining side, right? so uh, specifically on t using techniques that uh, um, called outlier detection or anom anomaly detection, uh, a lot of them are able to uh, suggest some potentially interesting point for you to say, hey, this node or this subgraph in this whole graph may be a little weird. Uh, weird we, is up to, de uh, def to define, but um, they may be able to tell you at least some, something. Um, and even better, they may say that, hey, so those five subgraph or nodes, uh, they're interesting, and these are the, they're ranked by the uh, anom anomaly, anomaly score, uh, the first one being most weird, second weird, and so on. But then that's often where the data mining uh, method stops. So what that means is they will tell you, hey, here's a thing to look at, uh, trust us, and off you go. Just do whatever analysis you need. And in reality, we know that's just not, not a good thing because how do I, how should I trust it? Right? How do I even interpret what you mean by this being most weird? Right? So uh, in this case, then you may want to apply, apply techniques from the XGI side. Right? Even something as simple as saying, visualizing the connection among the flag nodes. And then you may see the first four may actually be forming a complete graph. So in this case, in cell phone network, that means these uh, all four people, they call each other. So if instead of four, say 20, 20 node click, then uh, this would be really suspicious. That means those 20 people even, uh, either they, they're coming, coming from the same uh, big family, they do a lot of phone calls, or they probably some criminal, they're doing some kind of planning up to no good. Right. Um, also similarly, if you allow, uh, provide the uh, right interaction technique for the user to expand the neighborhood of fifth node, then we'll see that, oh, this is actually the center of the star. So, uh, in this case, it, this could be a telemarketer who make a lot of phone calls to many other people, but then those people don't know each other, right? So that's why they have a star. So this is a very simplified example uh, of uh, what I mean by combining techniques from two areas. Using data mining to suggest potential suggest, uh, suggestion points or investigation points, and then using visualization interaction to help you understand what do you really mean by uh, um, being flagged as these uh, weird nodes. So our research is on how to best combine 
Thank you so both area. What are the uh, uh, potential research opportunities there? Uh, combining the best of both worlds so that we can develop techniques and systems that are not only scalable but also interactive and usable. Right, so that's our mission and our vision. So uh, we have been working on a number of projects that are simultaneously at the intersection of uh, data mining, HDI, and some are more on the data mining side, some on the HDI side. And today uh, we're going to pick a, a few of the example projects and focus on those. Um, so uh, this is a very exciting uh, time to do research at the intersection um, because this is, I think, is a great time where um, both fields are starting to see the benefit of working with each other. So uh, at KDD, which is a uh, data mining conference, we have been uh, organizing a con uh, workshop called IDEA, Interactive Data Exploration and, and Analytics. Um, so this is the third year that we're organizing it. The previous two times we got Marty Hurst and Ben Schneiderman to give keynotes. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with HDI and visualization, you know these are the, the big shots, uh, big names in the area. And it's really exciting to be able to invite them, HDI and visualization people, to come to a data mining conference, which is pretty unprecedented to give uh, talks. So that's really to try to do the cross-pollination and encourage more work that's at the intersection and also some self selfless promotion. So in case you're interested in working in this area, we are having a, a journal that's kind of spin off from the uh, idea workshop, which is new in December 4. So submit, submit, submit. Um, so, okay, so back to today. Um, so what's the agenda for today? Right. So we want to look at how do we create scalable, interactive uh, tools for making sense of large, uh, uh, large graph. So I will divide and talk into three parts. So the first part, I will look at more, more data, data mining, data centric um, uh, kind of technique. Uh, specifically, I would put those techniques under what I call attention <coughs> mounting. So meaning, meaning techniques that can help route your attention to a specific part of the data so that you can start potentially start with those first. So for that, I'll give you two examples. The first uh, is about malware detection technology, uh, two systems, two related systems. One is called Polonium, the other called ESO, uh, finding malware in a large uh, 37 billion edge graph. And a second example is related to that is how do you find fraudster? So in the form of a subgraph in a larger network. So fraudsters usually work together. So I'm going to talk about network, which happens to find these anonymous or weird subgraph. And then, that's a, so that's the first part. And the second part, I would argue that well, just having the data mining techniques is not enough. You want to know not only where to start, but also where to go next. Right? Give feedback, the user gives feedback to the system to say, what is uh, things that I like, what is things that I don't like. So that's where the human into loop uh, mining is happening. So for that, I'll give you two examples. One is Apollo which combine machine learning and visualization to help people explore a large network. And the second thing is, how do you uh, have a, what we call Lego block of visualization that allow the user to flexibly combine or summon uh, visualization techniques on demand so that they can have a, a quite a view using instead of like, some dedicated ones that are or switching, have been switched to. And the last part is that some of our latest work, which is, I, I would put it under mobile analytics. So this is uh, one some of our newest idea on how we may scale up interactive application. Basically, having very scalable algorithms that are run in the back end, powering, powering the uh, human in the loop kind of mining that's happening either on your PC or even on mobile devices. So uh, AMAP is our latest work, uh, which is using uh, virtual memory to scale up computation on a single machine. So that's the today's menu, today's agenda. So I'll start with the first, uh, very first one, uh, attention routing, uh, specifically the polonium. So how do we develop a technique uh, that can help you find malware in a very large graph? So this was published in SDM 2011. SDM is uh, one of the top data mining conferences. And to help you understand what polonium does, uh, first a little bit about how malware detection is done traditionally. So it's based on what we call signature-based detection. So that means the security company uh, like Symantec, they would collect malware sample, they would generate a signature for each of them, and then distribute the signature to you as updates. So that's why you have a lot of updates if you're using uh, uh, malware detection software. And then your computer will scan for matches, uh, files that match those signatures. But there's a, a, a problem with this approach, because it's, there's always a lag. The company to generate first signature, um, and if there's no sample, then there's no signature, no signature, no detection. So there's always a lag. So how do you detect these malware early? Right? So that's where the uh, semantics of reputation-based detection approach comes in. So, so they're saying that well, instead of relying on signature, which is human generated often, um, how do we have? Uh, why don't we compute a reputation score for every single piece of software that a user would encounter, say Microsoft Word.exe, and compute a number for it? If it's 
high reputation score, then it's likely a good file. Low reputation score, then it's likely a, a bad file or malware. So poor reputation, uh, malware. So I'll tell you in a second how we compute a score. But suppose you do, uh, you are able to do it, then you can basically label every single file that a user uh, would ever encounter. And polonium is one of the approaches that are now deployed uh, and patented by uh, Symantec that are original that is uh, design and development. So now if you use uh, Symantec product, then you're using a piece of polonium. So it's now serving over 100 million people worldwide answering trillions of uh, queries. And in case you're curious, uh, I already hinted that I like to name things after myself. So polonium, polonium has polo in it, yes. Uh, and also it has an acronym. So uh, so Darren so may know that I actually I follow uh, Brett Myers' uh, first step to name things, uh, have acronyms. So it stands for Publication and Leverage on Network Influence on Earth's Malware. So it actually summarizes the main idea of Polonium, which is using network in, uh, effect. So in a second you will know what, what we mean by that. Um, so before I go into a little bit of detail, so uh, talk about the data first. So, so Polonium works with over 60 terabyte of data. This is uh, a little old, by the way. This is back in 2009. So now they have a couple hundred of terabyte. Uh, so back then, the data is contributed by 15 million. Now it's a couple hundred million um, machines uh, that anonymously uh, reported the executable files. So there are about 900 million unique files at that time. So now it's over a billion, a couple billions. Each one uniquely identified by its cryptographic hash value. So the goal is very simple. So that means if uh, with being, having all these machines and files, I want to figure out which file are good, which file are bad. So bad one are malware, good files are good one. So a lot of you may think, well, wow, this looks like a classification problem. Why is it hard at all? So there are three reason, reasons for that. So first is that we're dealing with a much larger data set. So that means techniques that work with small ones, they may not scale to a large amount of data. The second thing is that we want to detect all types of malware, not specific kinds. So if you're familiar with security research, often they focus specifically on some of the types of, of uh, malware, but not all, all of them. Uh, as a matter, we want to detect basically everything. And the third reason is that we want to aim for a really low false alarm rate or the false positive rate. So in practice, actually, we want that rate to be extremely low. But in research, often we allow it to be up to like 10%. That means 10 out, out of 100 is OK. But in practice, we know that's not, because you don't want to label all these good files and then remove them from people's machine. Right? So for all these uh, three reasons, it becomes a very hard problem. So how do we tackle this? Okay. Um, you can use a traditional view, which is you look at all the files kind of considering separately. But then we notice that, well, there's an important piece of signal that uh, people are not leveraging yet, which is the connection among files and machines. Um, by knowing what happened uh, to a particular machine actually tells us a lot of things. For example, we, if we know that a, a machine that has uh, downloaded quite a few bad files but, uh, in the past, now if that, that machine also download, uh, has downloaded another unknown file, that unknown file is more likely to be bad than good, right, based on the history. So, that's our intuition. So that means we want to kind of more explicitly, explicitly use the connection or relationship among files and machines. So that means we want to, we want to connect uh, a, a file to machines if the file is reported by machine or exists on the machine. So uh, using this kind of view or this kind of transformation, then we can build a bipartite graph out of the data, right? Linking uh, a file to machine. Uh, there's no link between files, no link between machines. Right. So after this transformation, there are about 37 billion edges and 1 billion nodes. The nodes are either machine or file. Um, we, get some, we get some labels from uh, Symantec. So they know um, uh, actually tens of millions of files, that whether they're good or bad. But since they're actually over almost 1 billion no, uh, um, files, so majority of them, they don't know whether it's good or not. Our goal is still the same. Label the unknown file uh, and the good or bad. Okay. Um, so Symantec kept all the... Uh, files that they know about in a, a ground truth database. And how you may use that is to say, well, if I know a file is a known good file, then I can say the probability of the file being good is 0.9. So notice that we don't really push it all the way to, to 1, because there's still some probability that um, that may not be accurate, as we actually see in practice. Um, so that means with that information, uh, knowing that some files are good, some files are bad, and also uh, maybe a little bit about the machine. For example, if a machine um, doesn't get update or doesn't apply update, 
that uh, regularly, maybe that's a KLS machine. So knowing that this kind of approximate information, uh, our goal is to figure out how to leverage the, that information to figure out what's wrong or what's the label for the uh, unknown file. Right? So how do we propagate the known information to the unknown? So how do we exactly do that? Um, so the key idea that we use, and you will see it again, is we use the idea called a uh, by association. So uh, the colloquial meaning uh, is that if I am a bad guy, and I know you, now I do, many of you, then, well, you are probably also a bad guy. So sharing the guild at, at some, some sense. Right, so guild association, whatever that's connected in the network, has similar property. So in many fields, it's called homophily. Uh, so here we have a more catchy name, guild association. Um, so in practice, what that means in our context is that good files are more likely to be connected to good machines, bad files are more likely to be connected to bad machines. So a very extremely, just extremely simple assumption or uh, view, but it worked very well in practice. Um, so more formally, you can put it in uh, a two by two matrix. Here we're saying that say a good file has strong strength of the, uh, association with good spot, a good machine, and low strength of association with a bad machine. So this is not the exact numbers that we use, uh, but this gives you an idea of the magnitude difference. Uh, between all those uh, different associations. Right. So knowing that uh, idea, so now is how do you actually apply it on doing the labeling? Right. Um, so we adapt an algorithm, uh, machine inference algorithm called belief propagation. Uh, so it's been successfully used in many domains in image processing, computer vision, um, error correcting codes, the, one of the best error correcting codes, and so on. Um, but it's never been used in uh, malware detection. So we're using it uh, for the first time. So. Instead of going through the details of what it does, I'm going to show you a very quick example of how it works. Where you can think of this as a toy problem, a dramatically scaled, scaled down version of the 37 billion F graph. Here I'm only showing you four files and three machines. I'll go to the label file two and three. Currently, we don't know what they are. So 0.5 means unknown, closer to zero means bad, closer to one means good. Right? So, uh, so two and three currently unknown. Uh, we know a little bit about file one, likely good. File four, likely bad. Machine A, eh, likely careful. B, a little bit careless. C, even worse. So our goal is to label two and three. So as the name suggests, belief propagation, right? So we do propagate something. So how do you actually propagate things? So we can propagate in any way we want, but for the illustration purpose, we'll say, well, let's propagate from uh, machines to file. So what's happening is that each machine node here would send a message to the files that it's connected to say, hey, so for example, machine A was sent to file two to say, well, file two, you are likely a good file because I'm a good machine, right? So we're using directly applying the Gilbert association uh, uh, assumption, right? Whatever things are connected, likely to be uh, of similar characteristics. So similarly, machine C would be telling file number three that, hey, you are probably a bad file because I'm a bad machine. So you do all this, all these uh, message sending, and then the files will aggregate all the incoming opinion. Basically, you're using your neighbor's opinion to uh, assess what you, you yourself may look like, right? And and then you can do it the other way around, going back to influ influence the uh, machines. So, so why do we need to do this at all? Uh, the reason is the machine reputation is only at in an estimate, right? We never know how careful or careless a machine actually is. The, own, the starting point is only our, our guess. Right? So here, going back, we'll, we know the actual the benefit of doing that to, to correct that. So you can do it uh, back and forth until things converge and then you stop. So in practice, we don't really need to do it until it converge because in, in the end, all we care about is whether a file is good or bad. That means whether it's above the threshold or below a threshold. So as long as it stays there, I, don't, I can stop uh, after a few iterations. Um, so I'm not going to go into the map, but I want to show you um, the nice thing about belief propagation. It's really simple. It only has two equations. All the, these are all the two equations that we're we're looking at. Uh, one equation tells you. I'm going to uh, color code it. So one equation tells you how do you compute the score or the belief uh, or reputation score of a node. So in this case, it would be say file three. Uh, if you want to compute the reputation score for file three, then what you need is the purple part, which is the uh, neighbor's uh, opinion. So that means what neighbor think of, think about me, and then also my prior belief. So that means when I, before I start, before I know anything about 
um, uh, opinion from my neighbor, what do I think about myself? So if it's 0.5, that means I'm unknown, and then you multiply it with the neighbor's opinion that gives you the uh, uh, reputation score, or uh, intermediate reputation score. And the second equation, as you may uh, imagine, is telling you how to compute an opinion. So this is the purple part. You want to compute an opinion, you would take your current belief, the blue part, <coughs> and then apply this uh, Gilbert association idea. Uh, technically, we call edge potential, but in this case, no more than a matrix. Uh, so that means if a blue node if it's a good file, then after applying this tr transformation, then the purple opinion would also be a good opinion. Right? So you apply these two equations iteratively, and then that would give you uh, the result, all those score. So in practice, Polyon was uh, when we when we evaluated, we tested on the millions of uh, ground truth files that Symantec has. Um, so this chart shows you how well it does uh, on those uh, ground truth data set using tenfold cross validation. So I mean, that means we divide a uh, ground truth data into ten parts using nine parts for setting the higher <coughs> information and then one part for evaluating. So horizontal axis here looking at false positive rate or false alarm rate. So that means good files mistakenly labeled as bad. So that means we want closer to this side as much as possible. So ideally zero, so no no false alarm. And the vertical axis is true positive rate. So bad files correctly label as bad. So that means you want as high as possible. So the ideal point is up there. Uh, you are top left. Yes. Um, so Polonium does about 85% true positive rate at 1% false alarm rate. So this is just by Polonium uh, itself without any other technique. So if it's used with other existing techniques, which there are hundreds of them, as Symantec is able to boost those techniques by 10 absolute percentage points. So this is a significant increase because that means if the existing techniques are doing 90% accuracy, now it becomes 100. So it's not a relative gain. So it's a significant gain. And uh, Polonium is also scalable. So at that time, we first tested it on a single machine uh, that has about uh, 256 gig uh, of RAM. Um, Using just one machine, it runs about uh, three hours uh, on the whole 37 billion edge for one iteration. In practice, we only need to run it about seven, uh, six or seven iterations. And now they have a multi-machine uh, implementation, so it's significantly faster. But for research, uh, since we don't have access to all their machines, we try it on our own Hadoop cluster, um, where we look at, oh, if we have access to, say, 25, 50, 75, 100 machines, how would they scale up? That basically scale uh, the lead publication. So we notice that a, the, the uh, scale is uh, roughly linear. Uh, whenever you use it, this kind of distributed system, uh, perfect linear scale is very <coughs> difficult. So anything that's close to linear is pretty impressive already. Uh, so this was done on a, M4, a Yahoo M45 cluster uh, that had about 500 machines. So, so, I've, so that, that was what I did when uh, I was uh, actually a PhD student back then still. Um, and now I have my own student, uh, and uh, his name is Jar. So he interned at Symantec uh, two years ago, or two summers ago. And the first question that he had is, well, so can we do something better than Polo? So basically he's saying, Polo sucks, I want to do something better. <laughs> and because 85%, you probably can beat that. So, and he did. So this is the ROC curve that his approach uh, was able to do. So instead of the a very bad 85% true positive rate. He's able to do up to 99.6 uh, true positive rate. So almost the right angle. Actually, it is the right angle at uh, 0 0.0001 uh, true uh, false positive rate. So it's also patented and deployed now and published at KDD 2014. So his, well, he named his own system, so it's called ESOP instead of something Polo. Um, and <laughs> so, so what's the, what's the uh, interesting thing about his approach? Right? So he observed that um, there's a missing step in Polonium, so, uh, which is that we are not really considering which files are actually installed together. So, for example, when you install a Microsoft Word, it does, just, it does not just install one file. It actually installs thousands of files. Uh, in practice, it's pretty hard for a software company to figure out which groups of files to get installed at a time. Um, so that means you need to infer that. So a jar is able to infer those. Uh, using uh, we call locality sensitive hashing, so it's that kind of fancy name. It's like an approximate way to compute uh, which set of machines or which set of files are commonly <coughs> installed together. 
So it's actually doing a jocosimilarity offset the intersection. They say, okay, so uh, uh, this set of machine, this set of, of uh, uh, company installed, and we'll put them all in what we call one bucket. Uh, so this is the, the step that was missing in <coughs> Polonia. Uh, in Polonia, we consider every uh, file kind of uh, a separate, uh, even though we have a graph, but we don't, really, we don't really get the grouping of the files. So in ESOP, we explicitly model that and uh, consider that. And then after that, then we do the delete publication step. Um, so that means now whatever things that got put in one bu one bucket, you are more uh, uh, you're more easily uh, able to label all those files all at once. They're either all at good or bad right, at the same time. So that's uh, how it drives the true positive rate uh, much higher and the false alarm rate much uh, lower. Right. So uh, that is the, the, the polonium and the much improved uh, ESOP. So both of them are now deployed. And so that's an example of where data mining techniques are really helpful, uh, actually, at the semantic is these could, the, the malware that flagged by these techniques could be the starting point of analysis and semantic, especially for those that's uh, in the ground truth database, but it turned out that they got flagged by Polonium and uh, the ESOP. And they say, hey, so those are the weird things. You might want to start uh, looking at them. Um, so you will notice that the Polonium and ESOP, they are focusing more on labeling single thing in the network. Right. But oftentimes you have weird things that look uh, that work together, or, or maybe a subgraph in, in our context. So that is where the uh, net probe system uh, tried to do. This is one of my earliest uh, uh, tools. That's why I, I, I like to like to mention it. I was almost a, a, yeah, it was the, my very first data mining project, and it's still very relevant um, because of this project uh, doing fraud detection on eBay. Actually, that's why I how I got an internship. Uh, at, uh, at eBay last year. Um, but actually it was not internship. They, they told me, well, you graduated, so you, you are not really an intern. So, so I worked there for a, a summer uh, on a little sabbatical. Um, and so this problem here is trying to find bad sellers on eBay, of people who get your money, but then they don't deliver item to you. So it's still a ongoing problem. Um, so how do we find the bad guys? So on eBay, you can uh, look at buyers and sellers as nerves in the graph, and then edges or transaction as transactions. Then the question becomes, how do you figure out which of these are uh, the, uh, doing some suspicious transaction, or which of them uh, may potentially be not giving you uh, uh, your product? Right. So bad guys are very, very smart. Uh, and if you do a lot of digging, you'll find that what they really try to evade whatever system that uh, that's in place to try to stop that. So if you ever, I, I think a lot of you use eBay. How many of you use eBay? Ooh, okay, good. So then you, a lot of you probably have that question uh, every time you try to buy something from a, from a seller. Is, well, do I, should I really trust this seller, right? And often how you judge it is to just look at the feedback score, right? Then there's a number next to the user account and it's a oh, 100. 100 means 100 good feedback, positive feedback. Um, so based on that number, and then to determine if uh, the seller is trustworthy or not. So bad guys try to game that, um, basically try to fabricate their reputation by trading with uh, accounts that they ought to control. So uh, what they're doing is they create two types of accounts. One is we call the froster account in red, and the other type is the compass account. So a compass account work pretty much like honest people. So they will trade with honest people, so address here means transaction. But every now and then, they would trade with the froster account, who eventually would be the ones that are defrauding the victims. So these are, uh, transactions would be for that we call the high value uh, transaction, meaning like uh, L left hot LCD TV and so on. So, but since the froster or the bad guy actually control both kinds of uh, accounts, so that is, there isn't really any any money changing hands, right? It's all control. The only thing that uh, they will be spending is a commission uh, to eBay, right? So they created these two, uh, two types of accounts, and then the nice thing about that is those high-value transactions would create some very strong evidence or fake uh, uh, evidence that uh, the Froster account are trustworthy. Because if you want to buy something from a Froster account and they look at all the feedback history, they say, oh, wow, this guy really paid on time on an expensive thing, like laptop, TV, uh, laptop, LCD TV, and so on. So what that means is that if you want to detect this kind of uh, reputation gaming or this kind of fraud, um, what you want to do is actually de 
try to de detect this whole uh, kind of subgraph. Right? And technically, we call it a near bipartite core. Uh, bipartite because there are two types of nodes. And uh, near because there are actually some missing edges. For example, there's no edge between this cluster and this compass. And it's core because there's a subgraph within the whole graph. So how do we do that? So at that time, there's no known algorithm actually do it. We try a whole bunch of algorithm, including belief propagation. Um, and it works. And instead of just using homophily, which you already saw in the Olenian case, here we also use uh, heterophily. That means things that are not similar um, are more likely to be connected. So in a more formal way, we can create what we call a 3 by 3 matrix, um, three kinds of identity. Foster, accomplice, and honest people, right? And here, uh, darker means more likely. So that means Froster are not very likely to be connected with Froster. Very likely to be connected to accomplice for the high value transaction. Um, not likely to be connected to honest people until they're ready to defraud them, right? So that's a similar way that you can read the, the matrix. So this becomes the uh, kind of input to the uh, belief publication algorithm. And the algorithm is able to pull uh, actual uh, bad guys from the uh, from the network. So the red ones are the ones that are flagged or reported by people in online forums. So some of you may be familiar. They're actually uh, websites that the victims create to report uh, that ah, I got defrauded by these guys, and then other people say yes, yes, yes. I. So what network is able to do is also pull out all the other accomplices and um, other fraudster account um, that that are <coughs> still lurking there that people have not reported. So this has attracted the attention from uh, eBay, and they invited me to give a talk at the campus, and then also a number of uh, reported in a number of news outlets. Actually, this is also how uh, Semantic got uh, or the Polin project got started because Semantic saw that hey, so it works for eBay, it probably worked for us. so that's that's how it got set, started, and then the Polonium and then ESOP, and the rest is history. Um, so that kind of uh, um, kind of finding subgraph, uh, you would say, well, this is only just one pattern. So what if I want other patterns? Right? So this is one of some of our latest work, which is a generalized set to allow you to, to not detect to detect not only one kind of pattern, but any user to uh, specify pattern. So in this case, uh, so the system we call a uh, mage as a uh, uh, approximate subgraph pattern. So in this case, the user uh, is able to specify uh, using query by example techniques the patterns that they want to find. So here we're looking at a graph, a Rotten Tomato review graph. So two movies, uh, the, the notes here are movies. Uh, two movies connected if two, uh, if, if Rotten Tomato user voted them to be similar. So if, so to, for example, B from Veneta, Fifth Element, a solid edge, that means a lot of people say that they're similar. So the user here wants to say, I want to find four movies. One is drama, action, sci-fi, and then the other, a star, wild card, I don't care what it is. I want to find them in this kind of relationship. Now pull all the matches uh, <coughs> that you can find from the whole million of graph. So match is able to pull exact match in this case. Underworld is actually the wild card. It has the elements of all, all the drama, action, and sci-fi. And also it can find approximate matches as well. So in data analysis, we know that uh, the importance of finding approximate matches because oftentimes the first example or first thing that people put in as query is not the eventual thing they want to find because in the beginning actually they don't know what they, they're looking at. So, ah, let's try this, let's try that. So having the capability of to doing approximate matching actually expand and help people explore what they may eventually want to find. So uh, Mesh is able to support that kind of approximate matching too. And there's a lot of application for this, not only in like finding uh, head ends in movies, <coughs> but also say uh, insider trading, which uh, we just finished. Um, finding uh, insiders, as in like Apple CEOs, CFOs, how they time their, uh, their trading. So we connect to insider if um, their, their trading activity are similar or are close in time. So we're able to find these gigantic uh, clicks. So that means, yeah, in the stock market, a lot of things are not really random. Um, so there's some of the patterns that are able to pull out. And in other contexts too, where we're working on a fake review detection, where similarly pattern mining is really helpful. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, detect, uh, fit, uh, review detection in, on, on Yelp, where we're able to find uh, reviewers who are uh, writing reviews for the similar set of restaurants uh, in a very close uh, number of days. So that means, say, okay, so here is the guy A and B. Um, they have written uh, reviews for the same 10 restaurants within the past three days, and then we'll build an edge. 
So after this kind of graph construction, we will find that whoa, there are these clicks, actually giant clicks in the in the graph. So those are the suspicious or the potential uh, bad guys that are uh, maybe uh, organizing their review activity. So there are many use cases for this kind of pattern matching. Uh, going back to uh, NetProbe, so we built a user uh, interface for NetProbe. We allow our user to inspect the, uh, the click that is found by NetPro. Uh, the user can mouse over uh, the notes and figure out and help understand uh, what is really happening. Uh, is it really a bad guy or is it not? So I, this is a purely kind of static visualization, if you would. And uh, there's no way to correct mistakes. So that means, well, if it makes a mistake, that's all, uh, all you can do. But there's not, no, no way to provide uh, feedback. So that kind of highlights the uh, importance of having human in the loop of the mining process. So there are times where the user may want to say, hey, this is what I want, so show me more. Or well, this is not what I want, don't show me as much. Right? So that is the, what the system, uh, Polo, uh, is able to help the user do. So it combines machine learning and information visualization to uh, explore a large network. So it's published back uh, in CHI 2011, uh, Human Computer Interaction Conference. And what it does is you can think of it as a way to help people to expand from where the initial points, uh, points of investigation are and to more uh, areas of the graph. So here's a showing an example of a citation network. So here the nooks are papers, address a citation. And suppose, actually, quite a few of you are graduate students, so I uh, suppose uh, I don't sure to tell you that, hey, so you are a new student, I tell you that's a good HDI paper to read, good data mining paper to read. Now go, go, come back in, a, in two weeks and then figure out what other paper I, uh, that you should also, also read. So that means uh, someone may be providing you with a starting point, or you may know the starting point, and you may want to find out what other things you may want to read or what may be uh, relevant. So intuitively, Notes that are, or papers that are close to your starting point are things that might be more interesting. So what does that mean? So since edges mean citation, so that means the direct neighbor of your starting paper are papers that are either directly citing it or being cited by it, which means they are re appearing into related work section of the paper, right? So that means uh, likely, but naturally it's more, more related. And if you follow that same line of thinking, that means uh, the second hop away uh, papers are probably still related, but less so, right? So that means the further and further away, the uh, less and less uh, related. Um, so using this kind of intuition, as you expected, uh, we could actually use the same idea, give association idea. But in this case, we're using it more uh, on sense making instead of labeling. Which also means you can use Billy propagation. So instead of going uh, through the, the uh, technical detail, I'm going to show you a very quick demo of how uh, Apollo works. So in this case, we are trying to map out the sense making literature. Sense making is a very broad subfield uh, within HCI that studies how people make sense of information. So as you may expect, uh, it covers many many areas. So um, so here I'm showing you a screenshot of Apollo about what we might want to get out of. Uh, at the end of the demo, this is kind of like a cooking show. I'm showing you the chicken that's done. Uh, and we will be starting off with uh, the seminal paper of uh, the cost structure of sense making, how people make sense, the model of how people make sense of information. And uh, in the end, we want to show, okay, so it actually overlapped the area, information visualization in blue, uh, information management in green, and collaborative search in red. And also in each area, we're able to find out which are the, some good papers that you might want to read um, in, in those areas. So the graph here is also citation network, so no that papers and just a citation edge. So this data is crawled from a Google Scholar back then, very painfully, 80,000 papers uh, and 150,000 citation edges. So the note size here means citation. So larger the note, the more times it's cited. So this is the um, Apollo UI, or also Apollo has my name in it. It's not a misspelling, but although I forgot what it stands for. Um, so <laughs> this is how it looks like in the beginning. Uh, you have the seminal paper uh, in, the, in the middle, the cost structure of sense making. At the bottom, you will see the same information that you will see on Google Scholar. So title, author name, and so on. And on the right, when there's only one paper, uh, then uh, it will show in the papers that either cited by it or being cited, uh, that is citing. So I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm familiar with the, the paper. So I will just be looking at the, uh, the title. And uh, in practice, you might want to actually look at uh, the PDFs and so on. Right, so I'm just skimming through the title, and then I see, ooh, so 
what may be some interesting thing. There's a pretty general paper that seems to be called information visualization. There is another one uh, possibly about search. So I close the panel and then I go back to each of the papers that just drag into the visualization and say, hey, yeah, let me create a temporary group. One is called search. The other one uh, I should call it uh, in both this. So it stands for information visualization. So two things happen. Uh, first thing is that color is automatically assigned to each of them. And the second thing is these two notes now become the kind of starting point of those two groups. The so one is the blue group, the other is the uh, the red group, or the starting point of the red group. So, so we, what you can think of is these two starting points are now kind of spreading their, their, their relevance, if you would, to this neighborhood and its neighbors and its neighbors again. So what that means is that you can actually ask for a suggestion. Uh, since there's an algorithm running in the background, Billy propagation to spread that relevance. So now I can ask for suggestions for the blue group. Um, so uh, by default, uh, all of them are ranked by relevance, so meaning relevant to the blue group. And just by looking at the pa uh, paper title, I see they will, actually the first two are relevant, right, because they uh, contain the word search, at least in the, in the title. And I drag them into the, uh, the same group, the search group. And then now I can go back to my original uh, starting paper. And I added uh, 10 papers that directly connected to it. And by default, they will be showing, showing up uh, ranked by citation count or the size of the node. But since I have the two groups created, so I can say, oh, why don't I sort them by how likely the Billy propagation algorithm things say are related to the info of this group. And by skimming the title again, well, first one definitely, information visualization. Uh, and then let's see the second and the third also related, so I will add them to invoke this group as well. Right, so I can do a spatial arrangement. And something you'll notice here much more clearly is that uh, actually there are subtle color changes in the node. So we're using color saturation to surface the internal uh, inference that the algorithm is giving. For example, this node, it becomes much more saturated. So that's telling the user, hey, so this is probably the next one you might want to look at. And you can skip the third one, which is still great. Um, so this is a very subtle but very effective way to kind of hinting to the user uh, instead of, uh, of, of the uh, other more intrusive way that to how to uh, guide their attention or to direct their attention to things that they may want to look at. And if you follow the same uh, strategy, um, you can go down again and you can say, ah, oh, there's another potentially pretty general topic uh, called personal, personal information management uh, where I can create another, new, uh, another group, uh, info management and it become another starting point for that group. And because you have a starting point, then you can naturally very, very easily ask for suggestions. Right, so that's how Apollo works. And um, the interaction is pretty simple. The user specify exemplars, and then the ability propagation help the user find more things. Right? So it's a very natural way, in kind of like having a partnership with, between the human and the machine, and to create some very personalized map. Uh, so even though the data is, diff uh, is the same, uh, different people using it is able to generate different, uh, different kind of mapping. Right. And um, yeah, so this is an example of how we may combine or using a mixed initiative approach to help people explore uh, large uh, network data. And whenever we mention uh, this, then people often will ask, well, this is, seems to be interesting, uh, this tool, but can it also do blah, right? So that is uh, one of our recent research projects, which is, is to uh, try to overcome, or to try to answer that question. Um, so if you have ever used visualization, a very common way is to uh, visualize it as force directed graph, uh, right? So, and uh, often it's very nice to look at, but it doesn't need to a lot of deep insight because it's aimed for minimizing at crossing, but the spatial um, arrangement doesn't really often mean a lot of things. So there are actually very good visualization techniques to try to solve that problem. For example, there's work uh, from Maryland uh, called semantic substrate, dividing the nerves into different groups. Uh, so each line is one group, and then using uh, hedge, hide, uh, hedge hiding to reduce a um, uh, edge overlap. There are also other techniques like pivot graph. Uh, so you're kind of putting in a scatter plot and then grouping nodes into a, uh, a super node, and they're only showing super edges also a very good way for summarizing. But the problem with this, uh, these kind of techniques is they are very specialized. 
So if you want to use these, you have to use a tool. Uh, they are not available generally in uh, tools uh, like Gephi or Node Excel or Cytoscape that often you might use, uh, but then uh, they are not available there. So the other alternative to that is, well, you can always program it from scratch, but it's, it's really painful, as you may know. I don't know how many of you have used D3 before. It's based on JavaScript, the most popular data visualization um, so a library out there, uh, but extremely painful to, to, uh, to program. So how can we do something better? Right? So that is where um, our, our research project called Glowstick, so Chad is the person who named this, not me. So Glowstick, as in the little Glowstick in the, in the, in the B, our mascot uh, bus. Um, so we want to come up with uh, kind of, we call the middle level kind of visualization that you can think of them as Lego blocks. So in that um, the user can flexibly combine so that they can summon those custom visualizations that you saw but currently are not available in visualization too. So the analogy I would like to give it is that we'll give you these Lego blocks, but in, and then you as a user will be able to to, to uh, build these uh, toy cars and an airplane. So in our context, that means we'll give you these graph level operation on the visualization Lego block, and you will be able to generate these visualization techniques on demand. So what does it really mean? Right? So I'll show you a very quick demo of that. So we'll do, do a quick demo of try to create the pivot graph which you saw, where it's a summary view of the network from a force-directed view, force-directed uh, layout, which you commonly see. So we'll start out with the force-directed layout. Right. So what we could do here is we can sort all the nodes horizontally, uh, by one attribute, and then you sort it vertically by another attribute, like gender, uh, if you're looking at people, and then you can do the grouping, so grouping is one operation there, in the super node, and then you can do some uh, kind of decoration on the edges, which becomes uh, the super, super edge, and then you add the axes. So in this example, what you're seeing that is that to get the pivot view from pivot graph view from the uh, force directed view, we are actually applying these uh, operation in sequence. So we call it substrate on x, which is a sorting on on x direction, sorting on y direction, sh uh, showing combined nodes, and so on. So these operations are what we call the uh, middle level operation. So they're actually very highly usable, uh, reusable. So that means you can if you implement or provide these operation. Um, you can actually very easily generate a whole variety of visualization that uh, have been around in visualization for a long time, but they're still not available in uh, kind of the tools like uh, Gatsby or Cytoscape. So, so the contribution is to say, well, we provide those middle level operations to you, and whenever you want these, any of these, now you can have it. Uh, I'm going to skip these things. So uh, impact for that is for analysts, uh, now you all of a sudden you have access to all these tools that you always wanted to use uh, but are not able to because they're not implemented. <coughs> uh, for engineer, um, what we're advocating now is that, well, you don't really need to reinvent the view and build everything from scratch. Now you only need to implement those operations. Whatever libraries you're using, implement those middle operations and the user will benefit from that. And for researchers, uh, that means potentially you could uh, much more easily uh, invent or come up with new visualization techniques instead of paying the huge price of doing all the low-level implementation. Yeah. So that is uh, kind of the more visualization-centric uh, uh, piece of work that we're working on right now. So that's our chess uh, PhD thesis also. So that's the second part. And uh, in the final few minutes, I'm going to talk, talk about the uh, latest project that we are working on. Um, I call it mobile analytics. but um, um, more, more appropriately, I would say, is actually a new way to scale up uh, computation, um, graph computation. Um, because for a lot of inter application, including Apollo, what I did not really uh, talk about a lot is uh, to provide a kind of very uh, smooth, streamlined interaction experience to user. It's important that the algorithm doesn't really get into the way. You want to say, ah, wait a, wait, wait a few seconds. Let me, let me run some computation and then I'll give you uh, uh, the result. So we wanted things to be happening really, really quickly. So that means we need a very fast and scalable approaches. And uh, MMAP is our latest project that uses virtual memory, uh, or more technically, is a memory mapping uh, to scalar computation on a single machine and lately on a mobile device on a billion, billion scale graph. So this is 
lecture work led by uh, Gerald Lin, who is my most senior undergraduate student graduating this semester. So he's going to apply to grad school, and he already has, I don't know, 10, 15 papers. So have to let him go. He will need to go to some other schools, I, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, mainly his work. And this also uh, led to a NSF uh, eager grant. So he also have experience writing grant proposal. So, um, so how to how do you, the question there is how do uh, how do you scale up computation, right? And so there are existing uh, techniques that involve quite a bit of learning curve. So the kind of predominant way, two predominant way is one through cluster or uh, distributed computing using a whole bunch of machines and scale computers. That's a very natural way of thinking. Uh, a problem with that is a, it often involves sleep, uh, steep learning curve. You often need to learn a new uh, kind of system, a uh, new um, architecture. And also, uh, it doesn't come free, so you need to set up, pay the electricity bill, and then all those machines, and so on. And the third thing, more importantly, is actually overkill for smaller graph. So um, <laughs> a lot of companies, a lot of researchers that I talk to, um, all, maybe 90% of them actually don't really have very large data. They think they have a large data, but actually they don't have a large data. Um, so directly jumping to these uh, cluster-based uh, approaches actually is, uh, I think, I think is, is uh, what, what do you call it? Um, uh, yeah, it's overkill kill for sure, and it also is probably wasting a lot of energy because you need to learn all these things. Right? And so that's one, one way to do it. And the other way um, that got people thinking, well, if cluster is, may not be the first thing we want to try, what about we try to kind of boost the speed of single machine approaches? Right? So that's where uh, GraphG, which is a spin off from uh, Graph Lab, uh, now it's called Dato, was a, a pretty popular machine learning uh, startup. Uh, graph sheets are based on a single machine uh, uh, architecture, and also late, uh, later it's called something called TurboGraph, which will improve on that. So both of these are single machine approaches. That means they can, on a, using a single machine, uh, like a desktop machine, it can uh, do computation on billion scale graph. So what do they have common is that um, they both create their own sophisticated data structure and also uh, explicit memory management. So that means that oh, I have a billion node graph. Um, how do you chop it up into smaller pieces, load which part into memory, which not into memory? Um, so all these things. So the question that we had is, well, can we do less than that? Can we not do um, those memory management? Can we not do those uh, data structure and so on? But then get the same or better performance? Because in practice, we know trying to convince people to uh, use your your the research result like you know, I have a cool library now try and use it well in practice that's not easy that very easy right because that means you need to convince a company to just kind of scrape everything that they've done and then use your tool so can we have better <coughs> approaches that are easy to to use easy to um, uh, in, in practice right. so our main idea is using uh, memory mapping or virtual memory for graphs so this uh, so I actually summarize our idea and it's extremely simple. So what we're here showing is, if you have a graph, uh, there are a billion uh, of nodes and edges. Uh, you can represent it an, as an edge list. So that means each row here is one edge. You have two columns. Like one is the source node ID. The other is target node ID. So you just pack all your, your edges. Um, so however many billion of them. And this file will probably take uh, tens of gigabyte or even 100 gigabyte, but that's OK. Uh, so this would not fit in a, in a single machine, like 32 gig, um, 64 gig even. Um, but what we do is we try to put this, load this into the virtual memory space, which is basically terabytes, um, uh, the virtual memory space of the system, and rely on the operating system to figure out which part of the graph is going to be loaded or mapped into the virtual, uh, the actual RAM, and which part is going to be offloaded. Um, so we're using the OS to, to do the automatic uh, arrangement. So actually, that's it. So what that means is that now you, if you have an algorithm that need to go through all these edges, you, your program can treat this edge list as if this is an in-memory 2D array and write the code as usual. And then the, the kind of memory uh, uh, management part is automatically handled. Uh, so it has a lot of implication because, so we'll show you results on graph, but uh, more general, that means it could potentially also uh, work for general data mining and machine learning that are currently um, 
kind of limited by the memory, uh, the author's speed is limited by the memory that you have. Using this approach, potentially, you could uh, make those algorithms more scalable. So the first question you may have is, why would it work? Uh, memory mapping even uh, work at all? So for graphs, we know it actually worked very well. Um, because uh, there are certain uh, strategy of um, uh, policy in the operating sy system to determine what are the things that would be kept in RAM. Um, so often it's based on what we call the least recently used policy. That means things that keep being used, it will automatically uh, kept in memory for a long time. Things that are not used a lot, they will be offloaded. So what translates into graph context is that high degree node, that means nodes have a lot of links, they are automatically kept in memory because, well, they are iterated through many, many times. Uh, things that are not used that much, they're, they're going to be uh, up, uh, adapted to disk. And the second reason that it works really well is even though is we defer that uh, to the operating system, uh, all these operation, operating uh, operations are highly optimized at the OS level. So what that really means is that uh, we're using the past 20, 30 years of research in architecture and, uh, and system research. We're using all those optimizations, and now we use it to speed up algorithm. So then we will try not to reinvent the wheel, but use all the fruits uh, that are uh, coming out from the system research. And the third thing is that we don't really need to use, uh, write our own code, right? um, because uh, it's already done at the lower level, at the operating system level. So some quick results. Uh, I have two more slides only. Um, here we're showing you the results on one uh, small, smaller graph, 60, uh, 69 million edge. The other is larger graph, 6.6 uh, .6 billion edge. Uh, the timing result comparing to two other approaches I mentioned, one's a graph chain in yellow, and then the other is turbo graph in, in green. Our approach ML is in blue. So on this smaller graph, uh, not surprisingly, um, everything is pretty fast in a matter of seconds. So we run on page rank, uh, classic uh, uh, algorithm, and also a connecting component as well. Um, so smaller graphs is probably not very exciting. For the larger graph, on the other hand, it's really exciting. Uh, first of all, um, basically both uh, TurboGraph and MF is faster than GraphG. And then the second important thing is MF is also still faster than TurboGraph. Even though may not, you may say, oh, this is not that much. But this is already a huge win. Because if you look at the code base of both GraphG and TurboGraph, there are thousands of lines. Uh, if you look at uh, MF, uh, it's only a, a, a hundred. But basically, you write everything as if it's just like array-based uh, computation. Um, and also, what uh, we are using the computation that we're using at AMAP. We are actually in uh, Java and uh, Turbo, TurboGraph and GraphQL and C++. So if you say Java is slow, uh, think again. So uh, this is what some of our latest results. And, and that also causes thinking, well, if it, it uh, works for Java, then probably works on Android. Right? So Android is Java, basically. If it works on Android, then it should also work on iOS. Um, so that's the curiosity got us uh, thinking, well, yes, maybe we should try that. Um, so we try on iPad mini and comparing the result to uh, MacBook Pro. So here we're running uh, on PageRank uh, algorithm also. We're trying different size of graph. On the smaller one, 31 million to the largest one, to one uh, almost 300 uh, million edges. So the iPad mini speed is roughly a couple of times, like four or five times, uh, slower than a MacBook Pro, uh, which actually is very good. So that means you can really run uh, million scale analytics on an iPad if you want. Um, so actually we do not yet know when you might want to do it, but you may have cases that you do <laughs> want to, uh, especially now that iPad Pro is coming out. So uh, there are these cases actually, uh, for example, um, there are, was a DAO program, uh, which actually on this topic, how do you do uh, mobile device computation where the uh, there might be a, a, a field agent uh, where you have uh, access to a device, but you, you are completely cut off from the command center. <coughs> you, you cannot risk by sending signal out uh, to a real location. You want to do it on device computation. So this pointed to the possibility of doing really, really scalable uh, algorithm at a, a reasonable speed. Right? So 30 million, probably bigger than whatever you want to do on an on a iPad mini. Um, so this is our latest result, and uh, we just recently got an NSF eager grant to study it more. Um, and uh, different, can we scale it up to or apply it to more data mining, uh, general data mining and machine learning algorithm, and also on distributed setting uh, using, for example, a Lexter platform uh, used for XPC. Right. So uh, today I, I give you an overview of the work that uh, 
uh, that's happening at our group. Uh, you'll see some of the work is at the intersection, like Apollo, and uh, some are more on the uh, data mining, some are more on the XGI visualization side. Um, so with that, I'm just going to wrap up and to thank our funding agency and more importantly, our students. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, now we, we can open the floor to questions. Um, it is past the hour, so if anyone needs to get going, feel free to, but uh, any questions? Some people might have already had their questions answered. Yes. Due to one-on-one -on -one meetings, but. Nope, is that it? Okay, I, now it is a question. Yes. Uh, I, I so I'm interested in the human in the loop, uh, like the Apollo yes. stuff that, yes. that you're doing. So, um, and I think it's like a really nice approach for doing this sort of initial investigation, but it seems like a, you know, a lot of these approaches, when you have extended interaction, mm -hmm. you make a mess of things at some point, yeah. right? And so I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about the the approach as far as sort of like pruning it down and like building it up and, and what happens in kind of the interaction space when people use it for more extended periods of time, and if there's different design approaches you might think about for that that problem of, like, do you get to the point where you've like, oh, I've made a mess of things and I need to sort yeah. of start all over? Yeah. Or, yeah, so how to, how, I think it's related to like how to manage the kind of spatial, the space that people have crafted. Over yeah, time. and it, it has to do with, you've, you've sort of, minute, you've simplified it in a yeah. way, but in, but then like as the sort of users building up the complexity of it, yeah. um, it becomes kind of challenging. So I'm curious if you have any way to either like track that or, or, or you've thought more, or is that just something you leave for other people to do to think about like the more extended kind of longer term interaction with this? Yeah, so, so something we have not done uh, is a longer term study of how people actually use these two and um, not only like in a single analyst uh, case, but actually also um, when you have more than one person maybe looking at data, like either sharing the same space or if they, you do your own thing, I do my own thing, so I create a map, you create a map. So how do we combine them or how do we potentially merge, merge those? So we haven't studied that, but that, that's something we want to do. Um, so we're, now we are turning Apollo into a more web-based version. So, we, okay. so th the hope is that once it's on the web, then we can get a lot more data about how people manage the space, how people kind of delete things, how they, how they prune things over time. Yeah, so, so far we have not studied, but yeah, we identified that's a, a very interesting uh, thing. So. Yeah, and it's interesting you use the sense-making um, as the example, because that's yeah. what people are doing when they're doing this, right? And, so yeah. that, and that's where you need this ability to sort of like yes. rearrange things, start over, uh, yeah. you know, remember what you did, yeah. show other people, bring them new kind of ideas. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's, it's, it's yeah. a really nice approach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in, in general, the kind of time revolving aspect of how people analyze graphs is, is still not studied that much. Yeah. Grand, grand proposal idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Don't be shy, I don't bite. <laughs> yeah. A question. Yes. Um, I'm interested in, like, in the fraud detection uh, sure. algorithms that you have, yeah. and uh, a lot of them are just kind of built off of, uh, you know, like network relations in the mm -hmm. sense of like we co-occur. Yeah. But you're also integra integrating dimensions like time now as well, like you're doing with the Yelp. Yeah. Um, have you also considered integrating dimensions like space, um, specifically like in eBay, where you also have the time, but also where these things are being sent? Oh, so where, where are we in integrate? So, yeah, so so good observation that, that a lot of this work are more kind of link structure focused. Um, so haven't looked that much into, or leveraged that much into the kind of attributes associated with the nerves or edges. Um, so so I, th I guess the answer is no, we haven't looked at it that much. Uh, some, some of it are kind of implicitly uh, uh, used a, lot, a little bit. Um, but I, I know a lot of people are, are working on how to combine, better combine both the link structure and the, and the kind of no attribute, edge attribute. So that, that is still like a lot of interest in an ongoing, uh, an ongoing research, yes. So, yeah, so, so short answer is mm, we're doing a little bit of that, but not, not specifically like shifting our, our focus too much on because we know there's a lot of people working on that already. I see. Yes. Um, sure. So I really like the homophily based approaches, um, mm -hmm. and then you present a very positive side of the homophily. Are mm -hmm. there any downsides to the homophily approach that, that oh. happen when you're, when you're using this? So, yeah. I mean, the one thing I learned is like, how should I actually hide my files? I should put them in batches for the, for mm -hmm. the latter one, right? Like, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so there, there are some downsides of using homophily. For example, I think that's related to can you game the system or can you crack it? Is it, Some, somewhat, yeah. Yes. Or I mean, because it seems like you get a lot of boost from them, but like, yes. are there are there 
downsides to doing this sort of homophily based aggregation, right? That yeah. you, with that with that algorithm. So you may not have seen them in the examples that you showed, yeah. but I'm just curious. Yeah. So there there are times where um, it would not work. For example, um, it, wait, what is it? Yeah, so some, if, for example, if you don't have enough labeled uh, data, um, and for example, you have like a large <coughs> subgraph that you need to label, but that's only one label file, if you apply that blindly, then basically that one file kind of label the whole, whole, I don't know, thousands of nodes, then that's the case that you don't want to do it, because that's just, you don't have enough data to, to really justify the labeling. But the algorithm will still run, so that that's the kind of, in practice, that you you want to avoid that. I mean, in research, we don't really care. Oh, yes, one one file labeling the whole ten thousand one. But in practice, that that's the thing that, uh, 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 like in industry, they, they care a lot about. So usually, there's multiple steps to to uh, to keep that from happening. Usually, they say, oh, only only do this propagation if there's more than ten files like within this this uh, region. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, if it's too sparse or too dense, in yeah. some cases, if the, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you hit boundaries that yeah. make it more or less. Yes. So in, yeah, in practice, there's a lot of uh, a lot of steps to to uh, to prevent that. So. Okay. Well, let's just thank again Paul. Oh,